Hey, great friends. On a Wednesday afternoon, do you realize, because I'm just coming on and I'm having a hard time realizing this. I didn't know it. Today is day 44 of the California lockdown. And you know, sometimes you don't know if it's Tuesday or Wednesday. I think today's Wednesday. I'm not even sure what today's date is. I literally don't know exactly, but I, it could be like April 29, somewhere in that neighborhood. Ding, ding, ding. But you start to lose sense, I think, of, you know, date, month, you know, how many days we've been in quarantine, at least for me anyway, because every time we come on, we, we put up in the upper corner what day it is. I thought it was day like 40. It's day 44 of the California lockdown. Great friends, so happy to have you here today. Lots to get to. The last couple of days have been crazy. Tony Baselli on Monday, unbelievable interview. I'm still getting people sending me responses to that. Jim Nance earlier, which I think we, we aired on Friday, some people are emailing me now from New York, CBS executives, that they haven't seen Jim like that and so cool, relaxed, chilled, et cetera. Really awesome. And then yesterday, Scott Farrell went absolutely nuts. There was that one part where he was talking about winning people money. He's like, that's right. I'm in people money. I win them money. And they do the dance. They do the dance. That they, what stood I, out to you? I was like, what, what was that, Scotty Farrell? And so anyway, it's been a great couple of days. Today, we got another excellent show coming your way. George Sedano from ESPN LA actually was texting me during the show yesterday saying, how do I get in? I want to talk about this LeBron versus Michael conversation you guys are having. George Sedano will be here. We'll continue the ongoing conversation, the daily conversation about the last dance on ESPN. But let's say hello to mi hermano numero uno, representing the 805 Oxnard, California's favorite son in the house. Grande. Hola. Um I can't believe of all the things that Scott Farrell did and said yesterday, that part stood out to you. Not the part we're talking about ramming people in the butt, not about, not about wishing people dead, not about like throwing ashes down a river. Like of all the things, the little dance that he did. Hey, he talk about this. He talk about that. He's doing this. I was laughing my ass off. I love that he called his picks Walmart prices. Yeah. That was, was really awesome. funny. Hey, I thought what was really cool about that whole thing was Everybody who's in our YouTube chat right now and everybody who's in our, our Facebook watch party right now, you know what happened during that interview? Some of you said, I'll never listen to this guy because I can't stand him <laughs> always. And then others of you said, bring the energy, bring it. I've known your show forever. Put this guy back on 1090. You guys got to understand something. If the reaction was, eh, you know, vanilla, boring, Nothing does nothing for me. If, if that was your reaction, you don't put a guy like that on the radio. It's, it's a guy who creates reaction, good and bad, yes and no. That's the guy who's polarizing. You say you won't listen. You say his voice will annoy you. And yet you you'll, you'll wind up listening. You will wind up listening. I'm still, I'm still, I mean, you're going to introduce Browner and then we can get into it, but I, I thought you weren't program director. I'm not. You're very confusing. I'm not. Because everyone's reaching out to you. You're mm -hmm. the one saying, like, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. You're clearly not telling the truth here. Okay. Well, hold on. I will tell the truth. But let me say hello to this young man right here. Take a look at this guy. Look at that ball cap he's wearing. I'm wondering if that John Browner maybe took somebody's logo, put it on a cap. You know? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> he hates you right now so much. <laughs> here he is. Six foot seven inches. 135 pounds. Twisted steel. Sex appeal, Big Macs, Big Sacks, bringing the street cred, representing the south side of Chicago, the brown man, Big Brown, John Browner in the house. What's up, America? How y'all doing today? Can y'all hear me? Dog. Can y'all hear me clearly? Can y'all see me? Dog, you just got your Barry White on right now. You feel me? <laughs> That's what your voice sounds like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you mean when it's not all hollow, when you're yeah. using your earphones and we hear you way the hell back here? <laughs> really? That's what your voice sounds like? Dude, nice voice. I thought the Scott uh, Farrell interview was interesting in the sense that he was saying a lot of wild, crazy shit, man. And when he talked about competing with the other local stations, I would love to watch that guy battle the morning show. Oh, my God. <laughs> Dude, let me tell you that I started to get calls from executives at CBS Sports Radio in New York saying, who is Pharrell talking about that he wants this guy <laughs> off the face of the earth? Like, who is he saying such terrible things about? And I'm saying, I don't know. And Pharrell said at one point, Sky, you know who I'm talking about. And I went, whoa, who? Yeah. Who are you talking about? And so 
the funny part is, is people are now texting me from CBS Sports Radio. And they're going, who was he talking about? Wh- who do you know? Wh- why is he out of his mind? And I'm like, listen, the, the, I said this to you guys going into it. He's one of the realest people, if not the realest person I know in radio. What he says on air is what he says off air. And I happen to love his fearless attitude. So I thought it was it was pretty funny yesterday. But yeah, there was that one point where he was talking about winning people money and he started doing this and he started doing his dance and I didn't know exactly what it meant and it was pretty funny. No, Browner? No, man. Stop doing that, please. No? You're not down with it? The the hands up part. You just- was it cool when Pharrell did it? Yeah, I mean, it was... I didn't. I don't know him. So when he did that, that was my impression of him. So I'm like, maybe that's his thing. That's what he does. I know you. You don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't do that. No. <laughs> All right, great All right, friends. Uh, I'm gonna do a little direct thing that we yeah. love to do on air because I'm OCD about what you look like yesterday, and your uh-huh. screen is the exact same way. This is nitpicking, but yeah. I need you to turn your screen down at least an inch. Turn there's it way down. Too, yeah, there's way too much ceiling. There oh, you go. Okay, better? perfect. Yeah. yeah, cool, man. It bothered the shit out of me. It was like, how did I not notice this yesterday? That it, yeah. your head was like I know. this much of the screen, and it was all this. How about so, this? If I push it down just even a little bit more, you know, is that better? Like, I don't. Yeah, you don't, even, you don't I even like, see all four screens. Okay, all right. Well, I, yeah. I see here Mountain Trust. You know, I see over here Corky's. Yeah. You know, now I you can see, actually see Seven cold, cold Brew. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. good. Okay, cool. So I want to just start off today's broadcast by saying thank you, Corky's Pest Control. Loving this. Loving the $35 refer a great friend. I'm a Corky's Pest Control customer. I say, hey, you should call my friend John Browner. John Browner knows how great the service is. He calls Corky's Pest Control. I'm getting 35 bucks. Then John Browner calls and he says, hey, my friend Alex is going to become a Corky's customer. Call him. And then Alex becomes a Corky's customer and John gets $35. I mean, it is really Corky just saying to all of his customers, tell your friends how awesome we are. You'll make money. And by the way, when you support Corky's Pest Control, you're supporting a company that keeps this thing alive right here, like we're PBS, um, right here, the Scott and BR podcast. And and name change could be coming. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Want to talk about Mountain Trust Mortgage and Realty Services? Thank you, Gary Cooper. We love you. We appreciate you. And all great friends who have ever done refis through you or bought property through you or sold um, have all had great reviews. 858-376-1299, 858-376-1299. Our guy, Gary Cooper, never make a move in real estate without calling Gary Cooper. Uh, Tory Holistics. Yo, 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 Tory Holistics. Hello. Can you do more for the great friends? Is that possible? I mean, the 20% discount with our promo code. Alex will tell you later in the show all the different savings that are going on, especially with Cinco de Mayo coming up. I'm telling you right now, this is your place to go if this is what you like to do. And I see everybody in our YouTube chat. And apparently you guys like to do this a lot because we're their number two website in their entire ecosystem, toryholistics.com slash great friends. So thank you for supporting our sponsors. Special shout outs to the Total T Clinic, Rock and Wine Tours, smsglobal.com, our texting partners, and coastcarepartners.com. Gentlemen, do you know what today is? Do you know what today's anniversary is? Yeah. Is, is it the dead stream day? Oh, uh, I thought it was hump day. I Whoa. thought you were going to go with that commercial. Whoa. No. What's that commercial? You know what today is? Hump day? The camel? No? Okay. <laughs> the Geico commercials? You don't yeah. remember those? Yeah. Yeah. You know what's amazing is that we now know commercials again. Like, because for all these years, we've watched things that don't have commercials in them anymore other than sporting events. But now, because we're home more than ever before, and you're probably watching TV in addition to just streaming services, you might actually know the commercials. The only reason I know commercials is because it's sporting events. It's the only time I will ever watch a commercial. And during the last dance, I have appreciated that they're very creative commercials, but they're very short. Mm-hmm. So I'm not complaining that too much about that. I wonder if ESPN is raking in a ton of cash off this last dance from a commercial standpoint because they know people will be watching it. So it is kind of like a game at the end of every week. It's two hours and it's a fixed amount of time. So advertisers can put their dough in to get inside the documentary. I'll bet you that ESPN is probably bleeding so much money right now that anything they can do to bring in money uh, would be a good thing. So, okay, look, let's what day is today. Uh, today is... Ooh. And I didn't, I didn't even know this, but I will tell you how I did. Um, Darren Smith, our longtime radio colleague at 1090, posted something on Twitter that said this was the day a year ago, because we've talked about when 1090 went off the air to then the announcement of 1090 coming back on the air, which is another whole story. My phone does not freaking stop, dude. We know. Oh, 
all day long <laughs> with people calling. I know Every you, I know, but all day long people calling, how do I get on this radio station? And yesterday you asked me a question. What's the strangest call I've gotten? I got a text message from somebody last night who wanted to know if we had interest in a, in a woman who used to be a newscaster in San Diego 30 years ago and who was married formerly to Jim Lampley. I'm like, uh, no, not, not really. I mean, he's like, well, what about do you guys, will you guys broker time on the weekends? I'm like, yeah, if you guys want to buy some time on the air. Yeah. Man, you sure. sound like, you just definitely sound like a program director. This not is program, program director talk. Yep. Well, let, let me tell you what I am. I'm not a program director, but here's what I am in this new 1090. Um, and then I want to go back to what, where we were a year ago. But in the new 1090, you got Bill Hagen, and he's the guy who you've read about in the newspaper who put this deal together. In 2017, when Bill found out that 1090 was for sale, by the way, did you guys know 1090 was for sale in 2017? Hell no. I didn't know. I didn't know that shit. When Bill Hagen went to Andres Bachara, the owner of the transmitter in 2017, that's when that began, the notion of Bill getting control of these airwaves. From Arizona, yes, lives in San Diego, has a place down in Rosarito right by the tower. Okay, fine. So um, as far as me being program director, that's not really the case, Alex. It's just that Bill is dealing with the, uh, first it was get the antenna, and now Bill is very knee deep into how do we construct this? How do we actually right. do this? How do we have Scott and, and the show in one location, but all the master control stuff of a radio station in another location so that show can be engineered to control and control can send to tower? That's Bill's world. Bill's job is get us on the air. Mm -hmm. Okay. What I bring to the table, you say program director, it was really actually very explicitly written here in my agreement with Bill which is what I bring to the table is, is this content, but also um, the suggestion of what the station should sound like and the relationships that I'm fortunate enough to have that I might be able to leverage to bring those people to the station. Okay, so I So you're the them. station director. No. <laughs> no, it's a consultant. It's station consultant, like, I mean, oh, but except this time, instead of being like most consultants and being overpaid, he's not paid. I would just say this. I'm not even really a consultant. I'm oh. a contractor, but I'm lending an opinion as to what programming I think we should use. That's all. I'm lending an opinion as to what programming we think we should use. You know why? How, uh, but how, here's why. Let me okay. just explain why. Because if the programming lineup was right, okay, and the station were instantaneously successful based on the content that it has on the air, uh, that would incentivize me to really, really want to make a long-term commitment to something like this. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, I'm, I'm starting to think in small chunks, six months, 12 months, 18 months, two years, you know, um, to think five years out, like Bill is thinking, um, I got to make sure everything's right. So when you say to me, Hey, look, I'll tell you what, smart guy, you think, you know what the best programming would be? You tell us, we'll get it. I'm just lending an opinion. That's really what it comes down to Grande. Okay. I mean, listen, you can call yourself whatever you want, but Thank you. you're, what you're doing is is program directing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what it comes down to. It. You may not have the final say, but you're going to give Bill Hagen the recommendations and the opinion of what you think is best for this particular uh, format and station. And I, I will, I'm because of what you said before that, that Bill is so knee deep in other things, I'm willing to bet that what you tell him he will listen to. Well, because he trusts me. I mean, he, he, this is why he came after what we do. Yeah. He's like, you guys have the history in the market. You guys have been successful selling the ads. You guys have had excellent ratings for all these years. You guys have high visibility, et cetera, et cetera. So dude, the, I'm entrusting the programming part of it to you. All right, let I, me ask you. I, don't very, wanna, I just don't want to say this. I'm not running things. Okay. But I have a lot of relationships that I'd love to be able to help yeah. So when I, so I've got relationships with Tony Bruno or Scott Farrell or Dan Patrick by way of example. I mean, I'm calling Dan Patrick directly. I'm calling Tony Bruno directly and you know those guys do more than just pure sports, you know? Mm -hmm. And so for me, because I think we do more than just pure sports talk, even though today we're just having like, you know, one of these in-depth business inside baseball talks. By the way, I watch everybody on YouTube. Joe Rigby's like, "Oh my god, 
The stories that Pharrell tells, radio is the most cutthroat, backstabbing, scumbag business in the world. <laughs> and people are listening to this stuff and they're hearing about it and they're commenting on YouTube and they're going, I, I just can't even believe what I hear about this business. So utilizing those relationships, Alex, is something that I've offered to bring to the table in doing this deal. I feel you. And um, let me ask you the juiciest question I can ask you right now. Go ahead. In your head at this moment, what does this lineup look like? Um, that's a great question. And I, I, I don't know exactly what it looks like, but in my, in my mind and in my ears. Cause did you guys see the, 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 I believe it's a fake Twitter handle, the mightier 1090. Yeah, I, I saw that. There's like a, pr there's a big promo up. It's like Dave and Jeff, uh, Dan Cilio, uh, who, whatever a fryer fill is hacks off for 15 minutes. Uh, then you, and I was like, where did this even come? But I'm like, oh, this is a fake one. They just happen to have the Mitre 1090. Right. So uh, that's not real, obviously. But what do you think right now? Well, Bert Grossman is texting me every day asking me when Dan Cilio is going to call me and <laughs> make his pitch to get back onto 1090. Did you guys happen to see on Twitter that Cilio was doing one of his crazy rants? And then he started Posting going screenshots? off. screenshots? Yeah, but then he's, well, not just screenshot. Anybody who keeps emails... It. <laughs> and shows people emails from five years ago. Scumbag. It's just freaking psycho, dude. I mean, I thought it was bad when you're constantly talking about your NFL career from 25 years ago. But man, the emails from program directors, it's so strange. But nonetheless, um, Ucilio mentioned Andres Bachara, the owner of the transmitter. Bachara came flying back at Cilio. No way. Oh, yeah. You didn't see any of this? No. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cilio and Andres Bachara had some beef on Twitter where Bachara had to set him straight and go, hey, brother, you never worked for me. You worked for a company called BCA that was in the United States that didn't pay me. And that's why we pulled that company off the air. It wasn't you. We didn't have a relationship. And then freaking Andres Bachara took a shot at the guy who used to run 1090, Mike von Glickenhaus, and oh. Jay Myers, the absentee CEO who lived in Daytona Beach, Florida, Andres Bachara took a direct swing at both of those dudes. Um, it's hard to believe, guys, actually. It was a year ago. I don't know, John, I don't know if you were there that day. Alex, I know you were there. But Jay Myers, who was the CEO of the company that nobody knew because he lived in Daytona, Florida, he made a big fat amount of money living in Florida just so that he could have his boy Glickenhaus make a lot more money sitting here controlling this whole thing or driving it into a glacier as it Ground. were. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Jay Myers a year ago was standing in front of everybody at 1090. Everybody was there. Darren, Marty, Linda, Billy Ray, me, Alex, Jordan. I mean, the list went on and on of everybody else who was there. And I videotaped Jay Myers <laughs> and his talk back and forth back and forth. Yeah. And I, he's walking, telling everybody, that's it. We're done. They pulled us off the ra radio. Our parent company's taken us down. All of that, by the way, was one gigantic lie, just so everybody knows. It really was Jay and Mike both knew that they were on their own. There was no more money coming from John Moores. John Moores was done financing 1090. It was up to Jay and Mike to make enough money to keep it afloat and what they did is they just kept blaming the parent company. Yeah. Yeah. The parent company said, we don't want to give you any more money. So now you have to stand on your own and you couldn't get it done. And but I, when you just you, like I the video, I have the video back and forth, yeah. facing, sweating under the arms, telling everybody that it was over. You know, I think when you just say like John Moore's financing, I don't think the majority of people knew that John Moore's JMI owned BCA, you know, like, cause like, do you remember during the whole stupid, uh, uh, soccer city, San Diego state thing, people thought 1090 was working for soccer city when JMI was really pushing for the other thing. And JMI owned us. It's like, it never made sense to me because people didn't know that JMI owned 1090. When I got on the phone a year ago with John Kratzer, who's the CEO of JMI. And I said, John, um, it's always interesting to me that you guys never tried to use 1090 to push your political opinions. And he said, Scott, that's the respect we had for you guys. Rather than John Kratzer, who's the CEO who now lives in Dallas, getting on the phone and calling me and going, hey, asshole, okay? <laughs> we, JMI, we want, so we don't want Soccer City to succeed. We want a new Aztec campus. We want San Diego State. We, John Moore's pumped so much money into San Diego State 
And he believed politically and financially that San Diego State should have the Mission Valley site. By the way, that's so much why they were trying to push the Chargers to downtown. Yeah. Because John Moores knew then he wanted the, the Qualcomm site for San Diego State. So John Moores put all of his political clout and his money behind defeating Soccer City. Who do you think these guys are? Fred Pierce and the other <laughs> guy. What's the, what's the other guy's name? Uh, I, I can't Carter. remember. Yeah, me neither. The guy from from San Diego State West. I can't remember his name. He used to be the city manager in San Diego. I'm I'm going to need to Google. Yeah, it. I'll look it up. Thank you. So it's important. It's an old guy name. Jack. Yeah. Jack. Jack. McCrory. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Who do you think these guys are? I mean, Jack was the city manager when Petco was being built. When Petco was being built, Moore's hired him. He took over yeah. Larry Lucchino's office in La Jolla. Do you understand the connection? So when so when JMI, when I talked to their CEO and they said, I said, why aren't you calling us saying, hey, dumbass, we are pushing for San Diego State West. We are trying to defeat Soccer City. Why aren't you guys calling us and telling us what to do? We respect you guys. Hands off. What it was was they didn't even know. They had no idea what was going on. They, they had left. They gave up on 1090 years ago. That's yeah. why Hagen was able to see an ad in 2017 that the place was for sale. They <laughs> stopped paying attention. John Moores stopped paying attention to 1090 after he sold the Padres. Okay. And all these years later, it came down to a year ago. Jay Myers, their hired CEO. He was my guy, by the way. He brought me back to 1090. After the previous CEO fired me, these were my guys and um, they just failed so miserably and they let so many people down and they did it by keeping people in the dark and no one really knew what was going on. And a year ago today, they took out the bobbit and they sliced your nuts yeah. right off, dude. They cut them right off. Yeah. I think and you're referring to a tweet that Darren tweeted a year ago and I found it this morning. Uh, cause I, I thought today was, was a year ago and I tweeted like I did enough cause Jordan was gone. He was out of town doing some, yeah. some bit family stuff. So I was doing updates for him and I did the two o'clock update. And then I don't <laughs> think we ever came back. The stream just got killed right there after the update. Maybe it came, maybe, maybe they, they talked for a little bit, but I remember like it was just silent. And in that radio station, there was never silence because even if we weren't locally programmed, we had ESPN going on. We had a game going on. It was, there was always noise in the building. And to look at the speaker in the control room and there was just nothing. Like that only happened like three or four times during our, our annual blackouts that we had. Yeah. You should, um, if you wouldn't mind, do me a favor. You know that a year ago, I think today, a year ago today, I released a podcast on my solo podcast with a guy named Mark Devine. Mark Devine is a, an author and a former Navy SEAL and a guy who created a, something called SEAL Fit. And he was amazing. And I went and interviewed him that day. And I went back to the station. I remember recording the open to the podcast saying, hey, guys, I may go out to a meeting here in just a little bit. And they may actually, this might be the day. And I'm almost sure that's what happened uh, for me. So it's a year later that we went off the air April 10th, I think. And a year later that we were actually all officially let go on April 29th. I walked out of there. You guys, if you've ever been fired from a job, you get a severance package and hopefully they take care of people. I was owed. Are you allowed to talk about this? What, bottom line, I got 10% of what yeah. I was owed. 10%. And they said, take it or leave it. And I said to my lawyer, well, let's sue them. And you know what they said? Sue them for what? You're going to sue them. You're going you're gonna to win. You're going to be right. And you will have dug yourself a hole and you'll never get a penny from them. So take whatever they're offering and get the hell out. Yeah, you re we released that Mark Divine on May 1st last year. I'm just looking at it right now. So um, something else, what else happened that day? I remember you did a long ass periscope of like everybody just kind of taking shit right away. Um, <laughs> and it was weird because I think like some people were happy it was finally over. But there was a lot of there was still a lot of people in there that really needed the paycheck and they just lost their job. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was just like a weird moment. And then that afternoon, I don't remember what time, but you tweeted out. We're fucking going on air tomorrow. Stay tuned. And that's when you came up. And the, literally the next day, tomorrow, we were at Callaway doing the show when you did a show with sunglasses on. Is that episode one? That's of episode one, and we're on 188. And we are on 188. We are on episode 188 today. That was episode one. We should, again, tomorrow morning, we yeah, should re-release episode one from a year ago. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Like, what were we barking about a year ago? And now, just interestingly, and I'll, I'll 
I'll just say this. It is interesting that literally as of the Super Bowl this year, I was long done with 1090. The ship had sailed. Truth be told, while in Miami, we had negotiated with CBS Sports Radio to possibly replace Pharrell. We had talked to another national network. I don't want to say the name because they're still chasing, even in this world of pandemic. I don't want to say the name there. Uh, there was another thing I feel like we had our, our eyes on back then. Uh, but literally, we spent so much time at the Super Bowl with the CBS Sports Radio people because everybody, both sides, thought that's where we were going to be. I yeah. wasn't even thinking about 1090. And I will say this in all seriousness, okay? Like, there was a lot of apprehension for me, a lot of nervousness on Monday making the announcement on KUSI. And today's only Wednesday. And I'm telling you right now, this thing has been steamroll, full speed ahead, offense all the way, um, two minute drill, get shit done. Hagen's doing his part. I'm doing my part. There's a lot of engineering talk going on out there about what has to be bought, what has to be where, what software needs to go where, where this studio eventually will call home. Cause everybody knows I've been doing this out of my house for all these months and I'm not I'm not gonna dude. Why? Why doesn't okay? And I know this is probably an off-air thing. Yeah. But it, you're talk. We're all talking about centralized, and if this guy's here and we're here and they're here, we need a hub here. Yeah. Like, like, do you remember we when we were looking at building a studio, we went to one off Miramar. Yeah. And there was a whole podcast. A Christian like, place. Uh, yeah. That it has studios no, ready to no, be leased not the out. Christian place. No, no. The Christian place was on is in UTC in that high rise. Oh yeah, no, no, no. I'm talking um, about the, 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 the place in Miramar. Board. Yeah, the place in Miramar yeah. has is like this podcast company, and they have studios. And Alex, you're and exactly an right. One. Yeah, they had no, an you're, empty one. You're exactly right. I mean, that that is a backup plan. Okay, and I hadn't even really given it much thought because yeah. I think Bill wants to do everything. Because I think I'm not sure. I mean, that's a good question. I really don't I know. Am. Maybe we should look at it. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, it's going to be dependent on what he actually ends up putting on air, and if he actually needs studio space for more than one show. He, um, so he, I don't, I don't know that he will. Um, he might, but even if he does, he might not need the studio space because people could do it from wherever. I think that that to me. Let me just say this: I love us all talking about this, and I love what's going on in the YouTube comments, and I, I love that people are interested on the Facebook stuff. But I'll say this: um, I, I, I don't know how big of a lift this is from an engineering standpoint. For me, it looks daunting. For other people that I've described it to, it doesn't. It depends on what you're trying to do. It, 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 if you're trying to build a studio like we had at 1090, Not yes, trying to. that is a Not massive trying. undertaking. If we're trying to do basically what we did with the access unit from, from your house when we did CBS, that's very, very, that, that's, that's not easy, but it's easierly, it's easy done as yeah. a comparison to the other thing. I think I lost my train of thought in the middle of that whole thing, but I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I did because I was trying to remember where Alex, what he had said prior to, but do you remember or not? I was talking about just a centralized location. Yeah, centralized location. I, I'd like to have um, my own centralized location, you know, where where we can work out of during the day. Same place, same thing, just like this, just at a different place. You know, that's kind of my thought. Like that I, like, I like, I have grown, I was thinking about it because I saw that Texas is going to open up uh everything i think on friday like everything like georgia and uh i was thinking about it, it's like man when the day comes that california opens everything whenever that may be and according to gavin newsom not for a while um i thought about sitting in traffic mm. going to solana beach and i almost got depressed like i was <laughs> like that shit sucked dude like i've grown accustomed to just sitting in my own kitchen uh to drive in traffic again it i'm almost that's how used to i am getting to being at home I now like it. I now don't <laughs> want to drive anywhere. I don't like going anywhere now. Like it, I'm like, what's it take? It's three weeks to become a habit. I'm well past three weeks now. By the way, you mentioned uh, Georgia opening up and and Texas possibly opening up, and here in California, you know our trails. You know, you got to understand if you're not in California right now, and you're and you're from here, you'll get it. If you're not from here, you might not. But I'm just going to tell you. People here in Southern California live here and pay the prices to live here for one reason, and that is to be outside in this weather. Yeah. And when you shut down all the hiking trails and you shut down all the beaches, I walked uh, uh, yesterday and I could see the beach across the street. Nobody on it. It's crazy to see. Did you go at night? I didn't go at night. I went during the evening and then my kids drove at night to go yeah. see all the flashy fish or whatever. 
Yeah, I think it's called the uh, the red tide and put it because it looks like really crappy water during the day. But at night, anytime there's any friction in the water, it looks like a like a blue light across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. My kids went. I didn't go. Um, I started a new series last night called Fauda. F-A-U-D-A. It's on Netflix. It's about these Israeli IDF guys who are infiltrating like Palestinian you know, terrorist cells. Dude, it's just right up my alley. Sounds I love intense. It. Yeah. Hey, by the way, speaking of intense, real quick, time out. No, um, that's my highlight of the day. Save it. Okay. Done. Okay. So anyway, um, I don't know where we were. Centralized location. Whatever. Staying at home. Yeah. Oh, here is my only thing about Georgia and Texas. And this could sound like a total dick thing to say. Yeah, I, was on, I was on a tangent. Yeah, about that. I can't remember. Anything. Go ahead. If when they open up mm -hmm. in two or three weeks, four weeks, if everything goes to shit, like, like, I'm like, you know, like, let them figure it out first. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. Like, Georgia, <laughs> you want to open up Georgia? Perfect state to test this in <laughs> Georgia. And you know what Georgia's right next to Florida, especially yeah. Northern Florida, another perfect place to just sort of test this stuff out. Sorry, Tony Baselli, much love to you and Ponte Vedra. But I'm telling you, if Georgia wants to try it and then Florida wants to try it and Texas wants to try it, I prefer here in California to see how things go yeah. out there. But simultaneously, I want my hiking trails, which I'm getting back. I want to be able to run and exercise on the beach, which I'm getting back. So progressively, we're making small moves. I will say this. I wore a mask in a grocery store yesterday. I can't breathe. Okay. When I wear a mask, I think I have Corona because I can't freaking breathe. Put I some glasses on with it. And then you oh, can't forget see it. Either. Glasses, glasses yeah. they all fog up. Oh, yeah. I, I had to look at my car yesterday. Do I have a mask? I found my daughters. They have these like fashionable masks. You pull on the strings. It tightens it up. Dude, I can't breathe out of a mask. And are you telling me starting Friday that, that after May 1st, if I want to go out for a run, okay, yep. I got, I got to wear a mask. Yep. I can't breathe. Yep. Yep. I've been out. Uh, I go out for a walk every day, me and the fiance, and it's been pretty warm, man. I don't know about Solana beach, but North park up in this hill, it's been pretty freaking warm. I come back and I'm sweating from here. To, like just here is the only place I'm sweating. Just drenched, dude. I'm really thinking about trimming this damn beard. I'm so hot. God, I'm not. I'm not gonna wear a mask like to walk out. around outside. That's that's fucking yeah, stupid. Cool. I'm not doing that. It. Now hold on, wait a second. I'm concerned about I'm not that. doing I that. I need to understand this. I need to get into the psychology of John Browner. Then you can't. that is impossible. I know because he's so unpredictable. Coming up today. George Sedano, I mentioned this earlier, George Sedano, ESPN LA is going to be here. We're going to have a conversation about this Last Dance documentary on ESPN. George is so into this, you know, from an ESPN standpoint, that even after the show, he's got a post-show podcast video style on Twitter. So we'll talk to George Sedano in just a few minutes. But hold on, Browner, let me understand you. Let me just back it up. From the beginning, you were the guy that warned us when we had that Trump attitude no big deal media hype you were the dude going no dude this is for real mm -hmm. take this shit seriously okay you're yes the first, you're the first per person of the three of us that had a mask true also true the only person right you were you were so far ahead of believing corona mm -hmm. when many of us i admit it i admit it hand in the air i thought it was bullshit i thought it was media hype whatever so you were way ahead of us and now, after all this time, as America has made incredible, like once in a lifetime kinds of moves, shutting down businesses, telling people to stay at home, unemployment going through the roof. This could be, it's being predicted by the New York Times, could be the worst economic situations literally since the Great Depression, because that's how fast the economy has contracted. Okay. So after all this time, now the government after telling us to stay home is telling us wear masks when you go outside mm -hmm. and you're telling me that the most concerned of the three of us from the beginning, you will refuse to wear a mask outside, which sounds odd to me because to me, the reason, and by the way, I want you to know, I don't like wearing them. Don't want to wear them may not go outside. So I don't have to wear them. But the point is, is that if you do go outside and you're not wearing a mask, people are going to look at you the way they used to look at people who were wearing masks. Because when I saw somebody wearing a mask, 99.9% .9 of the time they were Asian. Other times I would be like, why the hell are you wearing that mask? Maybe they had compromised immune system. But when you wore a mask three months ago, 
you are an outcast. Now, if you don't wear a mask, you're going to be an outcast. And let me tell you how people are going to perceive you. You could forget your mask. You're like, oh, I just forgot it. Sorry, sorry. People will look at you like selfish motherfucker. You don't <laughs> care about anybody else other than yourself. Because if you're not wearing a mask, it means you don't care about other people. I've thought this whole time, how would everybody get a mask? And by the way, what if you haven't worked in a few months and you don't want to spend $2 for five masks for everybody in your family? But I'm saying, Browner, I'm shocked to hear you say that you agree 100% with our friend in New York, Sid Rosenberg, who gets roasted on Twitter every day because he puts out things on sided like, Alex, you got to pull this up. Sid put out a debate yesterday. I'm not wearing a mask. Screw that. And you know what he said? You know why they're making us wear masks? It's the Democrats trying to beat <laughs> Trump and I'm not wearing a mask. So you, again, I've told you Browner's pro-Trump. I've told you this. Just Dude, like Trump, you won't wear a mask, just like Trump. I'm not wearing a mask because I have absorbed a lot of information, good and bad, about the situation. And I know being outside in the open air is the, the least way it can be transmitted. If you are in a, a place where there is recycled air, like an airplane or an office space, yeah, you should probably wear a mask. But if you're outside in the public in the open air and you're not following a person who's literally coughing, you will be fine. This is the other side of the, of the wave, I guess, the overreaction at this point. Because if you're telling every individual that when they leave their home, they have to wear a mask, who the hell is going to police that? You're going to write a ticket? You're going to write a <laughs> ticket for that? <laughs> well, let me Yes, ask they literally have been writing tickets for breaking for breaking social distancing rules or like doing things. That's exactly what right, they're going that, to do. But that's but that's crowds. That's lots of people gathering yeah. around each other. The rule been, is if you're going to be somewhere that you're going to be near someone six feet around you, so that may not be a walk. You may not be fine for walking if there's nobody around you. But if you're going to go to the beach to walk, that's where you got to wear one. Wait, so if I walk, hold on, no, 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 no. If I walk, if I walk my baby every yeah. day at yeah. eleven o'clock, yeah, and there's no one around where I'm walking. But is there a chance? I mean, is there a chance that you can run into somebody? You clearly cannot say that there won't the be. Of course, there's. So that's a what I'm saying. You have to have one on Here, you. Here's the question. That's the question. Will you? You're going to refuse to wear a mask out outdoors because what you've read now has convinced you that. Fresh air is good. Mm -hmm. um, will you be carrying a mask so that if if you do all of a sudden say, hey, there's people around. And, and by the way, hey, I want to stop into the drugstore. I want to stop into the grocery store. Will you be carrying a mask is the question. Well, yeah, I've always carried a mask in case I go indoors. If I go indoors, I always have a mask for me. If I take my kid indoors, I always have a mask for my kid. I don't go indoors without one. But if I'm going outdoors, no, I'm not going to wear one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I'm what pretty is your sure. Problem? What well, is your problem with authority, sir? Yeah, I don't I don't have a problem with authority. I have a problem with people who are uh, telling absorb, you what to do. No, absorb information and then go two steps too far to, again, telling people that everyone has to wear a mask is lazy. It's absolutely lazy. What's lazy about? I'm curious. What, what's lazy about? Because, I mean, I mean, the reason I ask is because let me ask you this. Would you go to Georgia and live in Georgia right now? Would you go into Texas and live in Texas? Right? I mean, feel good? Hey, no problem. They said open the state. It's all good. Would you do that? No, I wouldn't do that because so you like again, California's policy of keeping us still locked down mm -hmm. and, and providing that everybody needs to be wearing a mask out in public starting after May 1st. You like that? You're no. When you say, would I go live in Georgia? Would I go live in Texas? The answer to that question is no, because they've got salons open. They've got regular businesses open where people can physically touch you. That's not what I'm saying. I don't want to be physically touched. I'm not clamoring for a haircut. All I'm saying is if I want to go for a I walk am. outside, <laughs> <laughs> if I want to go for a walk outside, I'm not going to be hampered by wearing a mask because like you, I cannot breathe in it. Now, if I'm going into a business, if I'm going into a Vons or a Target or a Rite Aid, I'm not going to be in there for an hour. I'm going to be in there as quick as I can and get out. If I'm going for a walk yeah. with my kid, that's going to be like an hour. All right, I want to ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Alex, you're walking down the street. Mm -hmm. You see Browner. You don't know Browner. I run the other way. You don't know Browner. He's not it's wearing a mask. Me. He's not wearing a mask. You're wearing a mask. Yeah. Okay. He's not wearing a mask. You're wearing a mask. Yeah. And what is your impression? What is your perception? Yeah. You see that tall black guy over there? Motherfucker ain't wearing no mask. Everybody else mm -hmm. here is wearing a mask. Not that guy. What is your impression of that dude? 
Uh, the same because it becomes it's a strict thing on the first, but it's the same way I look at it now. It's like, all right, he doesn't want to wear a mask. Like, I'm not gonna get close to him if he's wearing a mask. I'm not gonna get close to him if he's not wearing a mask. Like, that's just me though. Uh, I'm not a judgmental person. I don't really give a sh- I don't give I don't give a shit if you if you perceive yourself as putting yourself in danger or not in danger. I just know that I'm looking after myself. So I, I'm gonna do what I think is right, and then Browner could do whatever he thinks is right. If this motherfucker comes up to me, starts coughing and talking to me, then we have a problem. But that's a whole different story. Okay. In the meantime, I, I'm in the grocery store yesterday, and I'm telling you that there's like nobody in there without a mask, and anybody who even not allowed at Arvons. Dude, people pull their mask down. I'm like, hey, 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 what are you doing? <laughs> What exactly are you doing? Um, yeah. You're not allowed to walk into our grocery store without a mask. Because it's indoors. It's circulated air. That's what I'm saying. Any business that has circulated air, you have to wear a mask because that is the way the virus is easily transmitted indoors. Mm. Well, anyway, I mean, listen, it's, it's happening. I mean, it is happening. I, I thought the whole time, like, what if- You know why it's happening though, right? It's not because of the transmission or anything. It's because we're loosening the restrictions. So you're going to be around people more often. It's all it's all to prevent this stuff. It's not like some That's probably thing. True. That's all it is. It's yeah. they're loosening the restrictions. We're going to be around people more often and they're just trying to take an extra step. Like so you can look at it like Sid looks at it cuz he's really good at his job and he's really good at pissing people off or you can look at it as browner and be like I don't need to do it, but really what it comes down to is we're going to be able to be a, at the beach more, at hiking more, and biking more, and doing more. So as an extra preventable measure, they're just making you do it. That's all. Wow. Here's a big uh, plane on Grande. If, wow. there, if we've been doing this for 44 days, shout out to Obama. We're the, <laughs> we're the test. Okay? We've been holding out. If we're in the state of California, we've been holding out for 44 days. What a test that, bro. What I have a question. Test? I have a question. Just because just I'm curious to know how you think about this, just because you're unpredictable. If Obama were president right now and Obama said, hey, hey, May 1st, everybody's wearing masks, what would John Browner do? We wouldn't be in this situation if we had Barack Obama as president. <laughs> Look at that answer. <laughs> Because we already we already did we already did this once as Barack Obama was president. Yeah, not quite like this. Yes, we did. It and just by the way, and I, listen, I'm not gonna get listen to me. I'm not gonna be pushed into being the guy that everybody now turns to and goes, "You're so pro Trump." It's not a political thing. It's not. It, no. It, it's but but the facts are the facts. This hey, was Scott. coronavirus did not happen during the Obama presidency. The H uh, the H one N one virus okay yeah. was mm-hmm. as highly effective, not deadly. Because it was, and it what did we all do? We of, all ignored it. We all ignored no, it. No, it was ignored. We ignored it. it. It was ignored. None of us paid attention. People got in front of it and it got taken care of before we got, got to this point. All right, did you guys see the article? Let me try. Let me try. And, me try and, and wait, real quick. There was nowhere near the media hype, and the president then didn't play the games that the president now plays. The president now eats this shit for lunch, man. This guy loves it. This guy, he can't get enough press conference. He can't brag about his ratings more. This guy, did you see Trump the other day talking about North Korea? If it wasn't for me, this is Trump. If it wasn't for me, not not the United States, me. If it wasn't for me, we'd be at war right now with North Korea. Trust me. And when you hear the president saying this like conceited, self-absorbed, egotistical stuff, you know, it's a turnoff, but doesn't change the fact that uh, in my life, H1N1, any other one of those viruses, psh, I was never paid one mind to any of that stuff. I guess because you had people in charge and they were guardrails in place that it would never have gotten not like really. this. Not really for me. That's not okay. my answer. Not All my right. answer. Okay. Let me ask you guys this question. Go ahead. Scott, you always ask, how serious is coronavirus? Like really, in in the grand scheme of things, how serious is this thing? Saw an article today. I won't say what website because I don't want anybody to be skewed. Saw an article today um, that put it into perspective. During the Vietnam War, 5,800, 2,000, 58,220 Americans. Sorry. I'm going to write the numbers down because I want to make sure I understand it. 58,220 Americans Mm -hmm. died during the Vietnam War. Okay, that's in in war. These are American service Americans members. service members during the Vietnam War that lasted more than ten years. Mm-hmm. Fifty eight thousand two hundred twenty Americans died because mm-hmm. because time period is important as well. Right, okay. in ten sure years because you ask here a short period of time here. Go ahead. Because you ask how important how how serious this is. Mm-hmm. Okay, according to Johns Hopkins University, we the United States has passed over a million people infected by coronavirus. Mm-hmm. 
How many people do you think have died so far by coronavirus? Give me a second. I want to take a legit guess. Sometimes when I go to, in fact, every time when I go to the grocery store and as I'm putting stuff up on the, the conveyor belt, in my mind, I try and do the math. Oh, I'm, I was so off yesterday. Oh, dude. I was so off yesterday. I was so pissed. I was like, oh, that's like 125 bucks, dude. I was off by a hundred dollars, man. Really? Ooh. Yeah. I, I yesterday thought I had about 105 bucks and then it was up to like 130. I'm like, damn, what did I miss? And then I realized, oh, wait a second, put in my phone number down. It came yeah. like right to one Oh four. And I was just a little bit over, yeah. but, but okay. So I want to make it a real so guess. We got a million, a million, 12,000 people have had, according to the, the, the John Hopkins university, over a million people have had coronavirus so okay. far. Okay. How many wait. people have died? Okay, a million people have had coronavirus. Of the million people that have died, I'm going to- A million say, people haven't died. No, no, I'm sorry. A million, of the million people that <laughs> have had positive tests, I'm going to say the number is in the 50,000 range. 5% yeah. of people who get coronavirus die of coronavirus. That's my opinion. What is it? It's a 58,000. Okay. 356. Okay. So it's 60%. So to make it round, 60% of people who have positive Corona cases have died of coronavirus. Now, I don't think that's the right math, dude. No, that is 60%. 58,000 is, 58, 58, oh, no, is not. I'm sorry. I'm at 6%. 6%. Yeah. 6%. I, me I messed up my math. I'm doing this live. God damn it. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay. So, I wish I had the IR machine. <laughs> Gotta do math. <laughs> so, so you have 6% of people who are positive Corona tests die of coronavirus. Okay. Yeah. Now here's one thing I want to say, you know, YouTube did something very interesting yesterday. They took down those two doctors in Bakersfield that, um, have their own opinion. They have their opinion. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I personally don't agree with it, but they have their own opinion. YouTube censored them and took them off YouTube. And I thought it was a really interesting thing to do because in the world of Cited, I want people to have a, a forum where they can actually have discussions and not be censored necessarily, moderated perhaps, but censorship is a serious thing for me. And so look, these two doctors, the first second I saw these two guys in Bakersfield, here's what I thought. Looking at the two of them, I don't trust them. <laughs> just looking at those two characters. I don't trust those guys. That's one, two looking at those two guys. I would never go to them as doctors like, Ooh, I'm sick. I need to go see these two guys. So I, I don't trust them just on looks alone. Then when you just hear what they do they're they own an urgent care and a couple of them, right? So they want people to go back to work, go to work, get, get hurt, sick, <laughs> come to me. I need to make a lot of money. This, it would be good for my business if you people all went back to work and got sick. So yeah. for me, this is just my opinion. I didn't trust these two characters from the very beginning, but taking down their opinion or taking down their, um, their push for their own gain. I really find very interesting by YouTube. Have they taken, they down, have they taken down press conferences by Georgia governor? Have they taken down press conferences by the Texas governor? Have they, has Twitter taken down ever any tweets for, for Trump because Trump is good for their business. So they're not taking down anything. They okay. have, they have taken down tweets from diamond and silk. Uh, those two women have also been right. fired but from Fox, Trump, but not and, Trump. But the reason why these doctors have been censored is because they're spreading misinformation and that misinformation is hurting the public and well, that by hold on hold on, hold on. It, it's very interesting you say that, that though because violate, hold on. Who, who, no no but hold on who should i who should i trust you or guys who have degrees they're not medical doctors they're osteopaths and they own an urgent care facility so so if i'm sick do i want to ask your advice john or do i want to ask these two doctors their advice if I was a actual medically licensed doctor. I would be giving you a diagnosis based upon facts and studies. The two, the 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 numbers and the the um, the conclusion that these two dudes came to was off of false data. That's why they were taken down. Not because of what they said. It's what they said was falsely created. I don't know, and, man. And then district. No, that's why it was know. taken down. It's not no, no. I, but I'm not sure if I buy that. I mean, I I really am not sure I Look buy that. You, 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 yeah. Well, I'm supposed to believe everything I read. 
Wow. I mean, no, you're you know, supposed to read a lot of things and then dis- and then figure out what you believe. You know, you, you mentioned Diamond and Silk. It's so easy to take down Diamond and Silk. What it's, is a Diamond and Silk? Diamond you don't want to know. Two, no, no, no. no don't, you don't want to know. Two black women. It's these two black women oh, who are no. the most pro. That was a clothing Trump. line. No, no, they're the most pro-Trump people. You could, they're more pro-Trump than Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity combined. These two women. That's not possible. And, and yes, it is. And and, and, and dude, um, the, it's very easy to take down influencers. And when when you ask somebody at Twitter, well, why don't you take down Trump and all the stuff that Trump does? And they're like, because he's the president of the United States and that is there for news. It's they, like, also, they also were told that they cannot delete his tweets and Trump yep. cannot delete his tweets because they're official public records. Well, it's it's just a very interesting situation. I don't even know how we got onto this topic. Oh, you were, so you were saying that there's a million cases. You asked, oh, yeah, you asked how serious it was. Okay. So wait, that's how serious it is. Okay. But I want to say one thing about the 6%. Now here's, again, maybe, maybe YouTube will take this down. Have you, have you seen, um, there are a lot of people out there who have this opinion. Many of them are in the medical community. How about this opinion? Somebody died. They did have a positive test, but the reality is, is they died of previous complications and yes, they were positive. So I'm a doctor. Do I really think they died of Corona or did they die of something else? And many medical professionals have reported that they are being pressured to call the cause of death Corona. So look, I, at this point, pressured by who? Where'd you read that? Pressured by who? You've not, by the medical community. Oh my God. I'm just supposed to read. I'm just supposed to, I'm just supposed to accept the medical community. No, no, but go, go look at there. There was a, there was a, there was a really interesting press conference with, um, with an African American female doctor. I saw by the way, you don't know what's real and what's not real anymore. No, you know, my only thing is like, not true. My, here's my only thing. Cause we don't need to get the details. The details don't matter. My only thing is you bring up these two dudes from the urgent care. And then you bring up this, this woman that's a doctor. And so like, that's where people are. That's why opinions are always going to be split down the middle. Cause you can believe this guy and not believe her, or you can believe her and not believe this guy. But, but, but the question is about YouTube censoring somebody. You know, if, if they take that away from you, you don't have the chance yeah. to decide. Well, I don't know how we got into the YouTube thing. I but, only asked because you wanted context. You always talk about how serious this is compared to the flu. Well, more people have died from this thing than died in a war that lasted 10 years. So that's how serious it is. YouTube yeah. is a privately run company, though, yep. and they have a right to take people down who, who disseminate misinformation. So I agree with you, by the way, that my son has walked in here and, you know, doesn't have any <laughs> regard for the fact that we broadcast live and then we'll try and have a conversation with me. And he's telling me I'm wrong about YouTube. What part am I wrong about? YouTube has the right yes, they have the right to take it. Of, no, listen, uh, listen to me. Of course, YouTube <laughs> has the right. This, they're not the federal government. <laughs> this is YouTube has the right to take down whatever they want to. Cited has the right to take down whatever they want to. Twitter has the right to take down whatever they want to. <clears throat> Facebook can take down whatever they want to. If you are, and by the way, some of those are, are publicly held companies. If, if you are a company and you have policies in place and you choose to enforce them, that's, that's what companies do. This is not the federal government saying you you can't show that or have that opinion. That's this is not even a violation of a First Amendment right. It's it's yeah. it's more of a censorship issue. That's all. Yes. That's yes. all it is. That's censorship all. is the issue. All right, let me let me do this. I see we're all cleaning our hands. My Do hands got a little, a uh, little Sweaty. clammy during yeah, this mine's conversation. Are clammy you got nervous. You got mine are clammy too. Uh, every time you and you and uh, Browner start going after each other, I'm like, okay, this is oh, going to take. annoying. It, it's years. it's not even where I want to go, but but it, I didn't it, go after it, anybody. It, it, it gets annoying. It gets, like we go down these political roads, and I always wind up getting pushed into like having to defend Trump when I'm not trying to defend Trump. It's just that it's just that you know to to always put up. It, it's a, you know what it is. It's exactly like the conversation we're going to have with George Sedano. Immediately, when people watch The Last Dance with Michael Jordan, what do they do? They bring up LeBron James. Now it has to be Michael Jordan versus LeBron James. Was Michael the greatest? Is LeBron the greatest? Is LeBron a better player now? And, and right away, it goes LeBron, Michael. It's the same thing here. If, if you don't like Trump, you immediately bring up Obama. And, and you say that Obama did something... Uh, with H1N1, dude, listen, I don't know. I really, I never paid attention, but, right. here's what I, but here's what I'll tell you. As a person who's relatively, just relatively in touch with the news, H1N1 
didn't even register on my map, on my, on my radar. I walked around every day, shaking hands, hugging it out, sitting next to strangers in restaurants, bumping into people, et cetera, et cetera. And H1N1 never meant jack squat to me in my life. This is a different deal, different virus, perhaps, yes, but different media coverage, certainly, and a different president who feeds the beast all the time. These, in my opinions, are the big differences between what happened then and what is happening now. And I'm just not getting pushed into what happens here is, oh, you're so pro this. and, you, and Who's you pushing you into oh, that? Dude, what I'm saying to you is this, is that you're not, you, my opinions are being told to you right now. Okay. My opinion is you tell me how great Obama did back then cutting off H1N1. I have no clue, dude. It wasn't registering on my radar. You're telling me how poorly Trump's doing now. I'm telling you, yeah, it's partly the, the virus. It's partly people not taking it seriously enough early. It's partly the president feeding into that. But now the media storm and by the way, you said it earlier, that's why you're not wearing a mask because there's so much disinformation out there and there's so much media related to all of this. So anyway, this is the conversation that George Sedano wanted to have yesterday, which was not Obama versus Trump. It was Jordan versus LeBron. And now from ESPN 710 in Los Angeles, here's our friend George Sedano. All right, George Sedano is back on Scott and BR. And first of all, I love that the last time we talked to you, we could see what was going on behind you. Still right. ESPN LA sign in what looks like a kid's bedroom. I love it. It's uh, it, it is uh, it was a guest bedroom. There's a day bed behind me. Um, and I've made this the office. Like it just, <laughs> it's what ended up happening. <laughs> so I love that yesterday, um, Scott Farrell comes on is going absolutely nuts. Shake and it up, Scotty. Yeah, right. It, it, do it in a dance. I'm doing it. Dance. I'm like, I'm like, this is out of control. He's crazy. He's out of his mind. I love it. But he mentioned you very specifically early on because I was saying that that of my closest friends in the biz, and I mentioned you as one of them. I said, I said, Pharrell, you're as real as they come, dude. And I said, no insult to JT, Sid, George, no insult. But he's just he's just real all the time. Did you catch any of that? Yes, I did. I watched it. it was, he's an insane person, but he's always been an insane person, and I love him. And he's right. When I met him, I probably was in diapers, at least from a, a business perspective. I was like a 21, 22-year-old kid. It was right after I met you, Cap, basically. Um, and he was in Miami working at QAM. He had come back to work local. He like It was crazy because I'll never forget the first day he was on lightning struck the tower and knocked him off the air like it was just insane like it is the most surreal thing i've ever seen for anyone and they were only on the internet at the time which let's face it i mean we're talking the ninth late 90s early 2000s like yeah. it wasn't what it is now um but yeah it was just he was a wild man back then and i worked with him briefly at fox when he was filling in for jt uh because i used to do the show after jt my first national gig was the overnight show on Fox Sports Radio. I was like 24, 25 years old. And, uh, and yeah, I would talk to Scott all the time. Whenever he'd fill in for JT, we'd do crosstalk. It was always a blast. That is really cool. And, uh, yeah, he was out of his mind yesterday. I've gotten so many messages from people at CBS Sports Radio saying, does he want to kill me? <laughs> does, 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 is it me? Is he, does he want me dead? Because he didn't say yeah. the name. People are like, is he talking about me? People were kind of freaking out about, about what he was saying. Yeah, he, he gets intense. And let's just say he holds grudges. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I have gone from interviews in the last two days from the absolute classiest of Jim Nance sitting in his home at Pebble <laughs> Beach to the angriest of my man Scott Farrell just spitting fire, dude. It was awesome. Look at you. You're getting Nance on your boy. He was on uh, Real Sports with Brian Gumble yesterday with uh, Joe Buck and Mike Breen, too. And look at you pulling that big guest. I love it. Flexing you know, the muscles. It was, uh, it was really fortunate. And, and I'll tell you a quick story. You'll find this interesting. Alex, you'll have to jump in here because this is almost hard to believe. We, we recorded this interview with Jim Nance. I'm telling you, George, it's 30 minutes, you know? Right. And at the very end of it, Jim is talking to me about a few things and his screen is, is just, it's all getting broken up. The audio is getting broken up. And I say to him, man, I, I, I got to go because we're going to lose the connection. And he said, you know, man, I don't really like the way this interview has gone. I really don't. He goes, let's do it all over again. I said, are you serious? He went into his office. He sat down at his hard line computer and we started from ground zero. We spent about an hour and 50 minutes, an hour and 30 minutes together to record two interviews, one that got thrown into the garbage and one that got 
saved and, and thrown out there. That's awesome. I mean, look, I've, I've actually never met him. Um, I've never been um, involved in an event that he calls. Like, I've been to Final Fours, but I've never had a chance to actually meet him. Um, and, you know, I, I've never been to Augusta, so there's that too. And, and I, don't, I just haven't covered NFL in so long. It's been almost 15 years since I've actually been to an NFL game as someone who's covering it. Um, so it's wild. I haven't crossed paths with him, but I mean, that story sounds very much in line with everything I've heard from everyone, but that's just incredible for anyone. Like forget just someone like him of his stature for anyone to say, yeah, right. yo, Scotty, we'll do it all over yeah. again. It's one thing me and you, right? <laughs> like we've known each other for 20 something years. Um, but, and, and I got nothing going on clearly, <laughs> you know, I, I'm in my, uh, you know, guest bedroom here, but for him to do that, that's impressive stuff. Yeah. It was really cool of him. So, um, uh, me and Alex and Browner here have become completely obsessed with The Last Dance. Now, oh, yeah. for me, I, I was saying, you know, I was in Miami in, in those games against, you know, Alonzo Mourning and Tim Hardaway, those early days of the Heat and when Jordan and the Bulls were the team that the Knicks couldn't get past, the Heat couldn't get past. And on the Western side of things, I mean, Carl Malone and the Jazz could never get past. Right. So for me, I, I feel that you know, the connection of Jordan, he was the superstar of my generation. Browner here is from Chicago. So, you know, this is like in his blood. Mm. And Grande's eating this thing for lunch. We're all completely consumed with the show. So I love what you're doing afterwards. My man, I got to send a shout out to Alan Sliwa. I love yeah. that you are really raising Alan Sliwa, who started for us as a sales guy 20 years ago and is now working his way into what he really wants to do, which is talk about basketball. So. Let me ask you, I mean, just first impressions. I'm loving this thing. I could watch it all day long. What is your first impression of what you've seen through the first four episodes? Well, I'd say it's, look, for an old head like me, right, who grew up in that era where I was in high school when Jordan was starting to win championships. Like all these things that are happening in the 90s, I can visualize them. I can remember where I was when I'm watching these Cavs games against ELO and like all these different scenarios, right? Like I'm envisioning just kind of going back to either my friend's house, my parents' couch, whatever, right? Like I can, I can have some fun with that. There's also been some educational stuff for me even. Like I didn't know that story about the uh, quote unquote cocaine circus, mm -hmm. right? And the, uh, the first iteration of the Bulls that he joined and they're in some preseason game or they're getting ready for a preseason game and they're in Peoria, Illinois in some random hotel and he can't find anyone. He knocks on the door and all of a sudden he hears, shh, shh who's there? And it's like, Hey, it's MJ. And they're like, all right, let him in. It's just the rookie or whatever. And he sees things he's never seen before growing up in North Carolina. Like I thought that was great, but I also think it's educational Scott for the younger generation, the guys Same. who grew up with Kobe or LeBron to see why this is the guy everyone really wanted to emulate. So yesterday guys, um, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a walk and I get a text from George and he says, Hey, I, how can I call into the show right now? How can I get into the show? Because what happened was our conversation turned into from Jordan and all this interesting stuff we're learning. It turned into LeBron, yeah. you know, and George says, how do I get in? And I say, George, we actually recorded the show earlier in the day and we're all watching the show because we're in our YouTube chat and we're in our Facebook chat. And we're actually watching, even though we're not doing it because we right. recorded it earlier. So George says, how do I get in? I say, you got to get in tomorrow. What prompted yesterday you to just say, come on, I got to get in on this conversation? So Browner was talking about LeBron not having good coaching. And I, I, I hate hearing that. Like, it just makes my, boil, my blood boil because it just disrespects a guy in Eric Spolstra who is a Hall of Fame coach right now, okay? He has the second best winning percentage of any active coach behind Greg Popovich at almost 60%, okay? He's got the third best winning percentage in the postseason in that 11 season stretch behind Popovich and Kerr. And here's the other thing. Like he has been as adaptable as any coach in the league and he can handle the guys with the big egos like LeBron, Wade and Bosch where look, not everybody can do that. Go ask David Blatt how that worked out. Go ask Mike Brown how that worked out. You know what? Ask Frank Vogel. Like it's going well now, but if they don't win a championship, it won't go well. Like, I think there's a lot of things that he doesn't get enough credit for, whether it's coaching guys like that, whether it's taking G League players and making them into players. Duncan Robinson is third in the NBA, okay, 
in shooting threes this season and three pointers made because Eric Spolstra is a genius at coaching basketball and getting him open looks. This dude was a backup player at Michigan. Eric actually told me this story because I did the game between them and the Pelicans before um, a week before the, uh, the quarantine. And he was telling me the story about how nobody went to Duncan Robinson's workout in LA and Chet Cameron, who's the Heat's longtime scout, like this is like a Riley guy through and through. And he told, he called Eric and he's like, I think I got you a guy. And he's like, who? And he's like, Duncan Robinson. And Spolster was like, the dude who was coming off the bench at Michigan for John Beeline? Like, why would we want that guy? And he, so he saw the workout and he's like, yeah, I can work with that. So whether it's getting guys like Hassan Whiteside, a max contract, which look, worked out not so great for them down the road because he's, not the easiest dude to deal with, but just getting the most out of guys. Like Spolstra is one of the best in the business. And I don't feel like he gets enough credit. And I think certainly since LeBron, he's proven to people that he is arguably, outside of Popovich, the next best coach in the league. I can't wait to hear Browner's reply to this because one thing about Browner is this. Even if you were convincing, which you were, and incredibly persuasive, he will not agree. <laughs> and, I, and I'm just – I'm kind of – it's – Oh, uh, you know what, Prouder, what do you have to say to all of that? What do you have to say to George Sedano, ESPN, NBA reporter and insider and expert, a man whose entire career is dedicated particularly to this league? You know, I, I want to hear what Browner's response to that is. Look, George, you're absolutely correct about Eric Spoelstra's coaching ability. That was never my knock on what I said. I said LeBron James won't allow himself to be coached. Eric Spoelstra has done a fantastic job taking the scraps that the Miami Heat have given him and turning that into a playoff contention team, not only with the nobodies, but even adding Jimmy Butler, take what you want of him, and turning that into a top three team in the Eastern Conference. That was never my knock against Eric Spoelstra. What I'm saying is LeBron James will not allow himself to be immersed in an offense similar to as Kobe and Jordan did within a triangle because he doesn't have that figure that he's looking up to. You know very well that LeBron James' relationship with Eric Spolstra, why it ironed out toward the end, was very tumultuous in the beginning to the point where LeBron almost shoved him coming out of a huddle. I'm not saying that Eric Spolstra cannot coach. That was, never my, that was never my intention in what I had said. I said LeBron won't allow himself to be coached. Pace and space is what came out of the Miami Heat. That design was because LeBron wanted the, the entire paint cleared out. It had nothing to do. No, with that's not true. That's okay. Not true. Break it. Okay. That, tell that's me. not true. Now you're uh, now I appreciate you clarifying that. Cause again, I jumped in mid conversation to you guys talking about this yesterday. So that's why I wanted to jump in. So I'm glad you clarified that part of it, but the pace and space offense was designed by Eric Spolstra because after they lost to the Mavericks, uh, where LeBron couldn't post up J.J. Bleeping Barea, who's my height, okay? <laughs> Eric Spolster said, he, he, he basically told him, if you want to win championships, we need you to play not point forward from the three position. We need you to play point power forward from the four position. And because here's the thing, if you put LeBron at the four, and it's always been, no matter where he's been, because after the fact, Cleveland did it occasionally, but mostly only during the playoffs. Ty Lue, uh, a lot convinced LeBron to do that in the postseason, wouldn't do it during the regular season. So your point stands to an extent. However, what Eric did was utilize the 2011 finals to say, no chance. We can't win unless you buy into this. And to LeBron's credit, he did. He bought into it. And that offseason, Eric Spolster spoke to Urban Meyer, Chip Kelly, um, a, a number of different coaches, Billy Donovan, John Calipari, like he talked to everybody, but including football coaches who did spread offenses, okay, like Chip and like Urban Meyer to really create that pace and space type of offense that they had for the next three seasons. But LeBron had to buy in and Eric made him buy in. You're right that they did have a tumultuous beginning to their relationship. Why? Because Eric was pushing him in ways that other coaches weren't. And it's why there's the infamous story that Pat Riley has told where LeBron was in his office with Dwayne and LeBron was like, do you ever get the itch to Pat? And Pat's like, the itch for what? You know, the itch to coach. And, and Pat was like, no, Eric Spolster is the coach. I don't get the itch. And you're right. There was the shoulder uh, bump or whatever, bump gate, whatever we were calling it back then. But at the end of the day, Spolstra won LeBron over because LeBron was embarrassed 
in that 2011 finals with his play. And Eric said, you want to win? I've got the system that we can create around you. So they did create that pace and space system with LeBron as the centerpiece of it. And that centerpiece was him as, a, as the power forward and basically the point power forward. And that was designed by Eric. That wasn't because LeBron wanted to do it. It's because he had to buy into it. Let me jump in here. And Alex, I want to, I want, because you and me are sitting here listening to George and, and Browner, and this is a very good intellectual NBA debate. But let me jump in here. My perception was always Spolstra was a guy that LeBron would never respect because Spolstra had worked in the film room and Spolstra had come up through the system and Spolstra was Riley's boy and he was never really accomplished enough on his own that LeBron would respect him like you might assume LeBron would, would respect a Phil Jackson or a Greg Popovich. Are you telling us, George, that, that Spolstra, though, he actually did win LeBron over. He actually did convince LeBron to be more of a team player, like we're seeing how Phil Jackson explained to Michael Jackson, <laughs> to Michael Jordan, <laughs> <laughs> Phil Jackson, Michael Jordan, where, where Phil says, hey, Mike, you may not win the scoring title. You may not even be the MVP, but we'll win using the triangle. Are you saying Spolstra accomplished that for LeBron? Yes. And after the loss to the Mavericks, they came to, there were two things that happened that offseason. It was Eric doing that, kind of doing the research for the pace and space offense because he thought to himself, if we can convince LeBron to play the four and I can get him to buy into that, he will see the effects, right? So there was that. There was actually three things, okay? So it started there with that, right? The other thing that happened, I, I don't know which one was first. It was either one or the other. Obviously, Dwayne and him went to the Bahamas and that offseason talked about how if they're going to be the best that they can be, it's got to be LeBron's team. So I don't remember which one happened first because now it's so long ago. Um, but those two conversations did happen. The conversation with Dwayne certainly happened and because he talked about it on his documentary that ran on ESPN a few months ago. And then Eric absolutely convinced LeBron to play out of the four position. And yes, LeBron started to see it work. LeBron also went and worked on his post moves that off season. I believe if, if I recall correctly, he actually met with Akeem like most guys do uh, in that particular era. And if you remember that first game against the Dallas Mavericks was on a Christmas day because it was the strike shortened or the lockout shortened season. And the first game of the season was heat at Mavericks Christmas day. And LeBron went to school in the post. Okay. And took dudes out in the post. And you saw the evolution of that offense right out of the gate. Um, so yeah, I, I do think all, all those things happen to force LeBron into playing that role with the heat. And he he'll talk about it. He, he was a guy that understood how learned how to win in Miami and then took that model and then tried to recreate it in Cleveland and so on and so forth. Big Brown, a, a retort here, because I, I know we got George for only a couple more minutes and we got to get, get hustling. What do you say? No, I, I, I agree what he's saying about pace and space. My only thing is when you find a signature offense for a particular player, again, we'll use the triangle as an example because that's the last dance is based upon the triangle pace and space did not follow LeBron in a sense of how the triangle followed Phil Jackson. Mm -hmm. how did, Michael Jordan tried to run a triangle in Washington. It was awful because the guys weren't good. But if, if LeBron James had taken pace and space to, to Cleveland and used it full time, to LA and used it full time, I think LeBron James would have far more titles under his belt to, to solidify his legacy, which, I mean, in all honesty, let, let's be honest, he's one of the greatest players ever. But I think that, to me, in my opinion, the way that he's carried his career, that has been the one thing that's held him back. He doesn't have a signature offense that he can say, this is what took me to the next level and beyond. Here's what I would say to that, Scott and guys and Browner and Alex, is that in Cleveland, it wasn't utilized the same way as it was in Miami, where that was the offense. And that's what right. you saw. And it was like, go ahead and try to stop it. Um, because it's impossible. You either have to double LeBron and somebody's going to be open on the perimeter, um, or LeBron will find Wade cutting back door, right? Or they're, they're, you know, and then they created havoc on defense to get into transition. There was just so many ways that they could, they could beat you. In Cleveland, that wasn't the, the focus of their offense, but when Ty Lue was there, he did force LeBron at times to play out of the power forward position because he knew that that worked. I mean, clearly the proof was in the pudding. It just wasn't a regular occurrence because LeBron didn't want to have to deal with the pounding 
that he, he didn't want to do it. Hands. Yeah. Let me get you guys. Let me get a quick, quick opinion by everybody. Do you Browner perceive this is yes or no? Do you perceive LeBron James as being coachable? No. George. I would say only under necessity. So I would probably lean towards Browner there. Grande. No. Yeah. You see, that's just it. Is that what we're learning from this Michael Jordan documentary? Is that besides Jordan being physically freaky and dominant as an individual, what we're learning about Michael Jordan is, and maybe people knew it, but that he was an unbelievably coachable person um, and took coaching and also dished out a lot of hard coaching. You know, one of the questions you asked this week, George, on side, which I love, and I'd love to get everybody's opinion before we go. We see Michael, jo Michael Jordan and Isaiah Thomas, and the Pistons leave the court, and Bill Lambeer says, that's the way you hand off the, the baton. That's the way you do it, because that's the way the Celtics did it to us. And you see a guy like Horace Grant say, no, man, that is not cool at all. And Jordan points out. That's not what he said. Yeah, he called them punk-ass bitches. <laughs> he says straight-up bitches. <laughs> straight-up bitches, not punk-ass. And he said, and Michael Jordan says, wait a second, dude. Um, I lost to these guys every year, and I stuck around. I shook their hands. They didn't. So George asks the question on sided, who's more petty in 2020 in this relationship? Is it Michael Jordan or Isaiah Thomas? George, first word is to you. You wrote it. It's your question. How would you vote, Jordan or Isaiah? I would vote Jordan um, because, look, man, it's been 30 years. Like, you got to move on at some point. Like, I get that like, you're Jordan and you're petty in a lot of ways, and we've clearly seen that. Uh, but you got to move on. Like, Isaiah's paid enough. Uh, and, and, again, I'm not the biggest Pistons guy or Isaiah guy even. But, good God, like, enough is enough. Browner? Oh, no, it's Isaiah Thomas, and it's not even close. Isaiah Thomas was asked who's the best players he's competed against in his career. He had Michael Jordan at fourth, okay? If Kareem's number one, <laughs> that's fine. Kareem's arguably the greatest player ever. But to have Michael Jordan at number four is pure saltiness. At a, at a level that saltiness has never seen before. It's right. a salt mountain. <laughs> this was the reaction. This was the reaction after watching. Because remember, he hadn't seen the documentary. So he's watching Jordan's reaction and him calling him a bleep hole on live <laughs> national television as 6 million people are watching. So now he's like reacting to the reaction, you know? So I, I, I'm with you on that, but I, I still feel like Jordan is the one that's harboring all these issues, right? It's kind of like when we were talking about LeBron, right, and the coaching. Like, that is a narrative, but out of necessity, I think that people do things that are different. Even LeBron this year with the Lakers and Frank Vogel. He bought into Vogel. He was playing defense earlier this year, right? And the narrative here is that Isaiah is the problem, right? And that Isaiah created all this. Well, who's been keeping this thing going for 30 years? It's Jordan who's been keeping this going. Alex, you get, the, uh, you get to break the, the tie here. Dude, Jordan is still mad at Scottie Pippen for that game seven. Like, Jordan is King Petty. It doesn't even – like, I know the questions about Isaiah Thomas. Michael Jordan is the most petty person that I think I've ever met. And I've never even met him. Like, he's <laughs> – like, like he's, he just seems like he remembers everything, everyone that's ever wronged him in any sort of big or small way, and he still is angry about it. So, for this particular debate, it's not even close. Michael Jordan, dude. He didn't even want to watch the video. He didn't even care what he was going to say. Well, he's a meme because of that, watching mm -hmm. the video. Another meme. Like, you know, that's, that's basically what came out of this. He's a meme again. Yep. All right, George, last thing. If I were to say to you, Judd Bushler versus John Browner, six foot seven inches. Oh, come on, dude. That's not even pounds, fair. He's never seen me play basketball. What are you I'm, doing? I'm giving you his <laughs> statistics, though, George. John Browner is six foot seven. He's 135 pounds of twisted False. steel and sex appeal. Big Max, Big Sacks, his whole game, right? He played college basketball. He, he has, you know, worked his way through the Kevin Garnett school of being swatted at UCLA. If I took a 55-year-old Judd Bushler and I put him on a court against a guy who's not even 40 years old here in John Browner, and sight unseen, who would you bet your money on, Browner or <laughs> Bushler? So I'm still taking Bushler because he played in the NBA. And here's a fun story for you. So when I was in Miami and I worked on the Heat broadcast, John Crotty, who was a longtime mm -hmm. backup point guard in the NBA, mm -hmm. uh, was John Stockton's backup forever. He was Tim Hardaway's backup in Miami for a number of years and ended up staying in Miami. He's one of their broadcasters. He told me a fun story that 
at the end of his career, like he's playing in the Detroit Pistons, he's in his late thirties or whatever, and his knees are completely shot. And one of the beat writers bet him, he said, um, cause he was talking about dunking and he's like, Oh yeah, I could just easily reverse jam it right now. Like no problem. And he's like, John, what are you talking about? You barely get off the floor. Even when you shoot a jumper these days, <laughs> there's no way you're going like reverse dunk between the legs, all that stuff. He's like, I'll bet you $50 right now that I can just grab the ball before practice even starts and do it. And he's like, you're on. And he went, he grabbed the ball, and he did it. <laughs> so I'm telling you, these guys, even as old as they are – now, granted, he was in his last season in the NBA. But Jeb Bushler or Judd Bushler, even at 50 or whatever he is, could still take you, could still yam it on you, could still shoot it over you. There's no, there's no question in my mind. Brown, or any defense to this? Listen, I'm not going to belittle George because he hasn't seen me play, but I will say this. I cannot wait to you, Scott Kaplan, relay this message to your friend, Judd Bushler, because this is going to happen, and this is going to be put somewhere live so people can see this. I will smash Judd Bushler. Okay. okay. I, I do not disrespect NBA players. The 15th man on an NBA roster would destroy anybody playing at a gym or a D1 college anywhere. I understand that. I'm not, I'm not that silly about this whole situation. But I played high-level basketball. I, can, I would smash Judd Bushler. This is a joke. <laughs> this is an absolute joke. And it's not because he's white. It's because yes, I it can is. play basketball. I'm not worried. I, dude, I can't wait for this. George, I, I hope you tune in when this actually okay. happens. I will. We'll do, it for, we'll do it for charity. We'll do it for fun. Whatever. I will, I'm going to smash this guy. Well, well, clearly I'm tuning in more regularly than you think. And also, um, I, we are certainly starved for content right now, all of us. So, Scott, if you want real promotion for this show, make this happen. Because if Browner beats Bushler, this is going to go viral. Yeah, it this is. is. This is great. Hey, George, we appreciate you. It is awesome to talk to you. I love all that you're doing surrounding The Last Dance. Love listening to you on the radio on 710. It is great to be with you. I hope you and your family are all healthy and well, and we look forward to having you back real soon. Same to you, Scott, and the guys. Take care, guys. Thanks, right, George. Bro. Thank you, buddy. Man. George Sedano, love that. I'm going to put this together. I'm, I'm going to start looking in my phone today. I'm going to find Judd Bushler, and I'm going to call him. And I'm going to see if we want to do a Zoom call just like that with George Sedano. And then, and then once and for all, let's take, let's take Browner's resume, Alex. Yeah. And let's put it on the screen against Judd's resume. Okay. And then this way we can set the odds as to who we think will win. I would say right now, if I had to take a guess, Vegas line, first line out. Okay. Bushler. 20 to 1 favorite. And you will lose your money. I listen, I'm tired of you disrespecting my athleticism, dude. You taking some dude. Bull, bullshit 1090 game that I wasn't even taking serious. By the way, that I spent an hour building the damn hoop before we even played the game. I cannot wait for this to happen because you have disrespected my athleticism for the last damn time, Scott Kaplan. I will not stand by and have you besmirch my athleticism, my basketball ability by telling me I can't beat Judd Bushler. Are you out of your damn mind? No, this a question. Might, uh huh. Oh, I, might, I, thought, might. I thought the I thought I thought you said that the fifteenth man on an NBA roster will kill anybody out in a ballpark. I ain't anybody, baby. What you talking about? See, so this goes to my question because Scott, you want me to get side by side resumes, and this is no disrespect towards John Browner whatsoever. Of course not. But I don't think John Browner has an NBA basketball reference page, so I don't know right. where I'm supposed to get that. Well, Browner will have to give you his resume. Hey, listen, man, ain't no putting no side-by-side, side, nothing, man. Throw that ball on the court. Anybody trying to hit on that, that old paper talk. That's well, let paper me, talk, let, man. Let me give you an example. Okay, so, so look, here's how you have to set the odds. You don't know. You don't know what Browner's got. You know, we saw him play one game. He was awful. He suggests that it was because <laughs> his teammates were bad. I mean, there's a million different excuses. Dude, okay, listen, so, stop. If you had to pass is, the ball, let me, I mean, if you had to pass the ball to Allison, who didn't know how to play, you would have got beat too. Oh man! Why but it wasn't her? like it That's wasn't funny. like you lit She's up the score. You. It wasn't so like what? you lit up the box score either. You know? Yeah, you didn't do anything. How many? So, I do. Okay. So Did you get like so, seven rebounds? And like over a bunch assists? of fat white guys. Right. You know? Again. So why would I take a bunch of fat white guys and a woman who can't play seriously? So Judd Bushler. So you should have dominated that game. Right. Judd, for what? Just just to prove to everybody it how was, much better you were. It was for fun. What nah, kind it wasn't of, for fun. What kind of dick would sure. I be if I it's, dominated I, this lazy-ass basketball game and I'm out there trying to have fun? I'm a fun guy, Scott. I'm a fun guy, Scott, but you're fucking it up. All right. You, you'll get Judd Bushler dunked on. All right. You're playing, you're playing with fire. Judd Bushler, 
you know, Arizona national champion, NBA, NBA champion. champion, some big shots and some huge games. Judd Bushler, very, very accomplished basketball career mm -hmm. from high school through top tier division one championship level college through the NBA, playing with some of the greatest players, playing for some of the greatest coaches, hitting some of the biggest clutch shots. That's Judd Bushler in a nutshell. John Browder, I'm, go ahead. I'm, I'm not telling you that Judd Bushler did not have a decorated career as an athlete. I'm not telling you that at all. Zero. <clears throat> what I'm telling you, okay, is that if you put me on a basketball court against Judd Bushler, he going to get that work. Okay. See, it's just hard for me to take you serious because I know that you did play a lot of basketball. Mm -hmm. And the only two like athletic things that I've ever seen you do mm -hmm. was that bad basketball game. Hey, everybody has a bad day. And you going and trying to swing a baseball bat against Heath Bell. Oh, just so, two completely different muscles. No, but just but yeah, but just in terms of like looking at somebody and being like, you see that guy right there? Really looks like an athlete. I mean, really looks athletic. You in the two examples we've seen. Just not not impressive to First me. First of all, hit a home run off East Bell. We all know that. He's acknowledged that too. That's what I mean. Like two, two, two. Clearly a liar. Telling you, telling you what's put the game together. Okay, put the game together, man. All right, I'm doing. I'm, 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 I'm working on. You disrespected me. I'm working on it right now. Before we get on here to Grande Alejandro and the highlight of the day, man. Alex, can you put up on the screen? We finished with George on his question about who's more petty, and. Me, Alex, and George all said we think Michael Jordan is the winner of this question. Who is more petty? But as it stands, oh, I thought you right wanted now, to talk about my sided question. Oh, who wins in a one-on-one -on -one pickup game, Brown or Bushler? Have you already Me. put that up? That's up. Me. Oh my God. Okay, great. I but was I'll show George's. I'll show George's. George, Me. Who, who's more petty in 2020, Jordan or Isaiah? Right now, I've got Isaiah leading the way at 53. percent That's what I've got. I got. Jordan at because I just voted 48.5 yeah. for Jordan 51.4 for Isaiah okay Bang. So, so hey uh for those of you that are in our YouTube chat I know I ask you guys every day and I'll, I'll put a lot of links in there come join us man because we are making massive moves right now and so okay let's uh let's move on here we are being presented today by Corky's Pest Control 1-800-901-1102 by Mountain Trust Mortgage and Realty Services, 858-376-1299. By Tory Holistics. And now it's time for the highlight of the day, man. It's time for the highlight of the day, man. Do you want to get high, man? I'm just really high. Highlight of the day brought to you by Tory Holistics. Go to sconbr.com, click on the Tory Holistics link. It takes you there. It shows you the promo code, hashtag, I mean, not hashtag, all caps, great friends, with a minimum $75 purchase for 20% off. They got lots of deals happening. Um, obviously, daily, like today is Weed Wednesday, so it's 15% off flour, Thirsty Thursday. So if you want to have one of them beers like, like old Browner had, 50% off tomorrow. Uh, and Sundays is 15% off all vapes. Go check them out, toryholistics.com. Okay, highlight of the day, I finished Ozark. I'm caught up all the way. Season three, last night, because we're in quarantine, this is what my fiance said to me. She's like, how many episodes did you watch today? And I said, five. She's like, you watched five episodes of Ozark? And I was like, yeah, I did. She's like, seriously? And I was like, what else am I supposed to do? Like, I'm not supposed to leave the house. I took you for a walk. We cooked dinner. I cooked dinner. Like, what do you mean? She looked at me like with his judgmental eyes. I watched five episodes yesterday because I couldn't get enough. Season three was badass. Um, and I'm done. And I don't know how much you want to spoil it here, but anytime you're ready to talk, I'm ready to go. Okay. So I've been asking you to watch Ozark for a long time. And, you know, you have rarely taken my suggestions. But because of the coronacation and because mm -hmm. everybody's talking about what they're watching on Netflix and because Ozark was so widely seen, you finally jumped in. How long yeah. did it take you to go three seasons, probably call it 30 episodes? That's 30 oh, hours of viewing. Yeah. Well, you guys were, when, when was I saying it was boring? Like three or four weeks ago? Like day 20? No, man. Because that long ago? Yeah. Well, I feel, like you took the, I feel like you took this thing down fast. I took season three down in three days. Uh, season two took me a little bit. Season one took me a long time. Season one took me from when season one came out to three weeks ago <laughs> <laughs> because I started it and it was so boring. 
Uh, but it does pick up. Uh, so I think, I don't know, whatever. It took me like, let's just say 21 days or something like that. Big Brown, you, you, you willing to watch Ozark or are there too many white people? No, man, I need some brothers in there or some sisters or something. Yeah. Uh, how about the very last 15 seconds of yeah. this season? You have no idea what's going to happen. Like I was going to say, how much are we going to spoil? Right. You're, well, I don't want to spoil, but but I was looking at it like, there's only like 15 seconds, 20 seconds yeah, left in the show. Up. They got to hurry up. What are they going to do here? And when they finished season three of Ozark, it was absolutely shocking what happened. Uh, I don't think it was shocking at all. I don't think it was shocking at all. I think that what happened to that person, whatever <laughs> may have happened, uh, was what they, I saw it coming. When they, when the, these people were able to negotiate the American thing to go to where they are. Oh, forget it. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I do. I do. And yeah, anybody yeah. who watched Ozark does. Right. So that's what matters. Doesn't. Like, Ain't no brothers. If you watched Ozark, you know, and I'm not spoiling anything. When the American people negotiated what they <laughs> negotiated, at the end, it was all bye-bye for the other person. It was yeah. very much coming. All right, the way it gonna... happened was, was dope. I was like, that's how you finish a season right there. That is how you finish a season. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. Okay, listen, Browner, standing by with a question that everyone wants to know, what is you doing? What is, what is you doing? What are you, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What is you doing? Uh. So, so today is what is you doing? Mm -hmm. it goes to a very, 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 very important person I hold dear close to my heart. It's me. Look, I need to talk to you, dude. You better never, ever, ever, ever go soft on these clowns ever again in any sporting competition because you see what happens when you go <laughs> soft on these clowns? See how they treat you? See how they disrespect you? See, what you did, you tried to go in there and be all friendly, be all like a good, you know, good co-worker, pass the ball, enjoy, have a good laugh, which what you should have did you should have went out there. You should have punished them, okay? You should have went out there like Kobe and Mike and not went out there like Braun trying to pass. So I blame you for this, what I got to go through now. But it's okay because we're going to be all right. What is you doing, John? Uh, let me just give you this advice. <laughs> I got confused in the middle of what is you doing. <laughs> you, now you can transcribe what you just said and write it in your journal so you don't forget. You know what? I will. <laughs> <laughs> he just gave himself a pep talk that's what happened yeah, that's i had great. to i had to i've been disrespected for the last time athletically on this program the last time <laughs> you better start training jack i will tomorrow today damn it today when this is yeah. over i'm going for a run he's and gonna remember, pop in nba 2k and remember remember no, no, what no. michael jordan said you you want six reps i'll give you 12 dude do the extra work to beat judd bushler I ain't going to listen. I'm doing extra work for me. And then I'm going to whoop Judd Bushler be just because. <laughs> All right. Before we roll, I want to say, Alex, do me a favor. Go on to the cited homepage. I'm going to flip through a few of these. Guys, if you can't do it, your point, you're saying you can't do it. I will try. Okay. Give it a shot. Um, I know we're kind of getting here to the end. Listen, there's so much fun stuff on here right now. Who wins in a one on one pickup game? Freaking Alex wrote that in the middle of the show. <laughs> Me, <laughs> yeah. I win. And Browner's already voted for himself like five times, I think. Uh, is that possible? Is that doable? I, I will make. So. I will make more accounts. Yeah. Um, how about this one? Should Kaplan invite Cilio on the show to interview him? Yes or no? Hell yeah. Why? Here's one. Here's the red pimp, the leader in the clubhouse right now. The red pimp, keep the fro or no? This kid is going to allow us to decide whether or not he keeps that giant red fro, carrot top style. Or if we decide that he gets to cut it off, what does so, the what does the leaderboard look like? Who's the top five? Red Pimp is in at two sixteen. Bernard uh, is in at two sixteen. Hans Gruber is in at one hundred and thirty four, uh, one hundred thirty three. D Train eleven is at one hundred and twenty six. And T Do uh, forget it. Whatever they had one hundred and twenty six. Shout out to them. Yeah, shout out to all of you guys. Red Pimp works this board every week. He's getting those twenty five dollar gift cards. He loves them. You know, probably needs a haircut. It's a college kid. Toilet paper. Hell yeah. Okay, listen, um, great day today. Thank you, George Sedano. Thank you, uh, Judd Bushler. Thank you, for what? John. For, 
Be, Judd Bushler Judd being Bush a part of done nothing around Judd, here. Don't Judd Bushler me. was part of the last dance, which inspired you to say something dumb, which right. was I will beat Judd Bushler up and down the floor, and now Judd Bushler is going to just take you to school, I Kevin Garnett style. I ain't seen Judd Bushler on one damn highlight on the last dance. What it's is, coming. What is you it's coming. The, there's a lot coming. All I ain't right. seen. But I'll tell you this: when uh -huh. we see the Judd Bushler highlight, then we're all going to be looking for the John Browner highlight. JB, well, go come. JB, yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you, great friends. Thank you, Corky's Pest Control, 1-800-901-1102. Thank you, Mountain Trust Mortgage and Realty Services, 858-376-1299. Thank you, Tory Holistics, toryholistics.com slash great friends, or use our website, scottandbr.com. Special shout outs to the Total Tea Clinic, to Rock and Wine Tours, SMS Global, our texting partners, and Coast Care Partners. Guys, great day. We'll be back tomorrow for day 145. One year ago today, we went off the stream, not the air of the stream. The next day we said, fuck that. We're going right back on. It's been one year. It's been a crazy year. Today's been a crazy day. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Peace.